This presentation was recorded at the 2015 ANZIX ACCCN Annual Scientific Meeting. Our next speaker is uh, Dr Claire Spooner, who's one of the paediatric neurologists at Starship Hospital. Um, she uh, completed her fellowship at the Royal Children's Hospital in Melbourne, and she has specific clinical and research interests in epilepsy, and particularly epilepsy surgery. Now, I've got to say, Claire's going to be talking about the difficult fit. I, I see no difficult. Pancuronium cures all. <laughs> we'll see. Alrighty, so I just uh, page down the way. Alrighty, well, I feel um, rather humbled to be speaking uh, here and after the very eloquent and informative talks. It's, um, I promise it's half an hour and I believe there's drinks upstairs, so we'll whiz through, huh? Um, so today I thought I would just sort of go through status epilepticus. Um, obviously, many of the children that present with status hopefully don't make it to the ICU, but many do, and those children can be very problematic. So what we're going to do today is just go through what status epilepticus is, because there's a lot of controversy over exactly what that is. Um, review the spectrum of patients that you typically see in the intensive care unit, where epilepsy is the primary problem or potentially a secondary problem or a symptom of another underlying disease process. Um, review the treatment and the evidence for efficacy of status epilepticus, and this is where we'll start speeding up really, really quickly because there's not a lot, um, and review the outcome data for that. So it is not an insignificant problem. It affects five, per 40, five to 40 per 100,000 annually. Um, mortality rate is high, up to 38%. Um, 30 to 40% are refractory to the first and second line agent, and those are the patients that end up in you know, intensive care units. So moving forward to talk about status. Um, so status by definition is um, a little bit vague, but we talk about a seizure being prolonged, or we talk about a series of seizures for which there is not full, com full recovery, so that symptoms are either still present when the next seizure starts, so the child or, or adult uh, has a persistent Todd's paresis or a reduced level of consciousness, so they're back, not back to their baseline state. And it's also considered to be status if the EG is abnormal between uh, seizures if you have that data. Um, sort of it makes sense that the uh, prolonged seizure results from an initiation of some mechanism which leads to an abnormal or prolonged seizure and there is failure of the usual uh, mechanisms responsible for seizure termination. Um, it can result in, you know, the reason that we're worried about it is that it can result in significant neuronal injury uh, due to an, an alteration of neuronal networks. Uh, it can be exacerbated by other factors. So if you have a well child who's seizing, the, the impact from that may not be as great as a child who has other metabolic demands of their febrile or, or otherwise. The time period for which we have considered status has been extremely variable historically, you know, ranging from five minutes, 10 minutes, 30 minutes, two hours. And when you're not sort of um, given a definition of when status is considered to be status, when it's causing harm, the, the motivation and the impetus to uh, commence treatment and terminate the seizures becomes very clumsy and, and variable between departments. So more recently, there has been significant efforts to improve the classification to ensure that not only are we uh, communicating well between each other, but it's a motivation to treat and know when to treat and institute um, management. But also, hopefully, by defining seizures for what they are, the uh, epidemiology and the uh, outcome data from various treatments that we institute can be compared against like um, groups of population. So the difficulty you have when you look up literature to find out whether a drug is effective in status, you may be comparing someone who's been deemed to have status for five minutes versus someone who's deemed to have status for three weeks. And so the outcome of drugs in those two situations are vastly different. So in, there has been a, a new definition of status which has come out essentially uh, this year and it talks about a concept of status and an operation. So um, the T1 is the time when the seizure is unlikely to spontaneously cease on its own, and that's five minutes. There's very good animal data um, and human data showing that if you're seizing at five minutes, you are highly likely to continue to seize, and that is the time that you should be intervening. Um, T2 is the time that we believe that neuronal injury is likely to occur, so that's the time that we hope to have aborted the seizure. So you have 30 minutes, five minutes to commence treatment and hopefully uh, have effected that treatment within 30 minutes. 
So as I've alluded to, not all status is equal, and this cartoon kind of depicts that. At the top you have uh, a couple with the, the husband looking, or partner looking poorly, uh, holding his head. He's got continuous spike and wave on the background on his EEG. He walks into the hospital door. He's given a shot of benzo. Uh, he was in absent status, and he walks out the door a happy man. You can see that underneath that you have a patient wheeled in by an ambulance. He goes in with the same EEG pattern, goes through the door, winds up in ICU and goes out in a hearse. So um, <laughs> I'm not sure that's because he got to ICU, but clearly... Uh, and the other thing that this cartoon that I really like, or not really like, but um, depicts very nicely is a feature and a phenomenon that we see very commonly in epilepsy, is that while the patient is uh, debilitated, you have a couple, you have the codependent spouse helping the patient along, he's cured, the spouse is ditched and he's off on his own, a happy man, so... <laughs> So not all status is equal, and I'm just going to quickly run through the definition of status epilepticus, refractory status, and super refractory, for which the bottom two are the ones that we probably are most concerned about today. So status epilepticus is our definition of five minutes uh, of continuous uh, clinical or electrographic seizure activity or recurrent seizures without recovery. We like to classify it further by uh, seizure semiology, etiology, um, so sort of whether the seizures are convulsive, uh, generalised convulsive, uh, non-convulsive, whether we know the underlying cause, what the EG correlate and age. And some of this information is likely to predict um, outcome and our understanding of the condition. And at the moment, we don't have a lot of data on different outcomes based on this information. The more we gather, the more we can be prognostic at the onset of uh, individuals for which treatments may differ depending on what sort of status that they have. They may go down different treatment algorithms. Moving on to refractory status, this is patients who do not respond to the initial standard treatment. So this is really your ED treatment or out-of-hospital treatment where they have an adequate dose of benzodiazepine. Uh, in ideal settings, if they're non-epileptic, that's out of hospital, but otherwise on admission. Uh, and then an adequate dose of at least one other anti-epileptic drug. And, and that, can, that algorithm, if um, performed efficiently, should be able to be completed within 30 minutes. But in being generous, 30 to 120 minutes, you should have failed benzodiazepines and at least one other anticonvulsant. And if you're still seizing at that point, we consider it to be refractory status. And you should be considering a, uh, escalating treatment at that point. Uh, super refractory status is generally now considered that with seizures continuing despite uh, additional anti-epileptic drugs, whether it be a second or third line uh, anti-seizure medication and uh, specifically in institution of anaesthetic agents, which is often uh, then quoted as persistent seizures at 24 hours. So again, papers that vary in terms of their data, but 12 to 40 percent of those uh, presenting with standard status epilepticus will uh, move into a refractory status epilepticus, and of those, 10 to 15 percent will end up with super refractory status. So that's kind of our definition. That's the, the, the types of uh, status epilepticus that we see. Now I wanted to sort, just sort of talk about the patients that we see in the intensive care unit where the status is the primary problem and that's why the patient has come in. Um, clearly it has an underlying etiology uh, but it, the, the, the epilepsy is the presenting problem and, and also those patients where they have a clearly defined other condition where they are also having seizures which may or may not be status and we're going to just kick the second one off quickly first. Um, so those patients uh, in ICU who have critical illness are at high risk of seizures. They, as I say, may, may reach a criteria of status or they may not. Uh, we know that uh, there are many conditions in the intensive care unit whom are prone, which are prone to seizures, sepsis, stroke, going through the list, head trauma, uh, encephalitis, immune-mediated conditions, renal conditions with hypertension. Um, and those seizures may be obvious and easily uh, aborted if they last for five minutes with a single dose of benzodiazepine. The difficulty is because of the comorbidity of the, the patient and their other illness and the fact that they may be intubated and ventilated and comatose for other reasons, sometimes those seizures can be uh, difficult to detect. They're either subtle or electrographic. And we're now increasingly aware that the detection of those seizures is, is critical to optimising their outcome. So looking across uh, intensive care populations, 10 to 40 percent of children with critical illness experience electrographic seizures, and a third of those will be in electrographic status. Um, it, 
there can be some EEG patterns which are difficult to determine whether they're just periodic patterns versus uh, seizures, and that is important in terms of uh, the need to treat and the likelihood of uh, changing that pattern, but that's hopefully something that your neurophysiologist and uh, epileptologist can guide you with. But the risk factors for those patients with uh, non-convulsive non status or sub subclinical seizures, uh, young infants, uh, the occurrence of they've had a clinical seizure or they've presented with convulsive seizures or status prior to their admission to PICU, then they're at high, high risk of uh, non-convulsive seizures ongoing. If they have clearly a structural brain injury or if they have the presence of uh, plead-like activity or interictal discharges on their uh, initial EEG. The extent to which um, these seizures adversely affect overall outcome is, is controversial and you have two schools of people that feel that the underlying uh, condition is the biggest prognostic indicator and that the seizures are just a symptom of that and don't add any further uh, burden. However, there is definitely emerging evidence that seizures on top of the injury do add uh, negative outcome uh, neurologically. And in a recent prospective study of uh, about 230 children, they measured the interactal and the epileptic burden, and uh, for every, I have to read it, I can't remember the exact data, for every 1% increase in hourly seizure activity was associated with the 1.3 odds of uh, poor neurological outcome. And so it's very hard to tease these uh, factors out in terms of those individuals that are likely to have more epileptic activity are also m more likely to have a severe uh, uh, underlying brain injury. So it can be hard to adjust for those confounders, which they did their best to do in the study, uh, adjusting for disease severity. So there's certainly a trend for the epilepsy itself to add burden. So in those individuals that are survivors of their neurological injury, if they're fitting, that's going to worsen their neurological outcome. So it's kind of critical if we are going to have survivors, if we can make uh, their disability lessened in any way by treating their epilepsy. And so this is just a, a little study just showing the vari variation in detection of electrographic seizures dependent on the clinical uh, presentation. So whether they had clinical seizures, whether they had uh, intracranial pathology. So this data of the critical ill uh, patient presenting with clear cut seizures or reduced level of consciousness is really resource uh, problem for the future. We currently have four monitors where we can provide continuous EEG monitoring. We certainly don't have the staff um, or the resources to read all of this data. Um, and certainly in centres that don't have uh, epilepsy uh, centres on site uh, and tertiary neurology service, accessing this data and interpreting this data is challenging, but this is going to, I think, become standard of care. Uh, certain, I think on my next slide, no, did I put it up? Um, ooh, sorry. How do I go back on this? Do I go back? Can you just take me back one slide? Is it just? Right there. Um, so there are guidelines from the American uh, clinical uh, neurophysiology group in which individuals should be have continuous monitoring in the intensive care unit. And so those are the patient, any patient with a persistently altered mental state uh, following clinical seizures, patients with acute brain injury uh, and altered mental state, and patients with unexpected fluctuating mental status. So you can imagine in your intensive care unit that would be a fair chunk of your patients who are having recommendations for continuous EEG monitoring. Um, so moving on from your general patient who's just unwell to those that present with status um, or with epilepsy as the primary problem. So that's either those with refractory or super refractory status, uh, and it's typically in an individual who already has a known diagnosis of epilepsy, or this is their first presentation with new onset seizures for some reason. There's also, which I'm not going to talk about at all, but obviously the complication of the acute management of seizures in the emergency department or elsewhere uh, due to excessive use of benzos or other drugs for which um, may or may not have been necessary and the patient comes attended with a loss of airway and you don't know whether they're fitting or not and you have to support them, um, hopefully you wake them up and find that their seizures have stopped uh, or monitor them to, to identify that. So excluding that group. 
um, just quickly, epilepsy is the primary problem. In the paediatric age group, we have a number of syndromes which are at high risk of status epilepticus, and there are some unique features about their management which I'll just touch on, which again, you know, working closely, if you have neurologists on site, this should be their role in terms of guiding the management, but there are many uh, specific uh, treatments which are more likely to precipitate or aggravate and sustain a status epilepticus in some of these individual syndromes and some drugs which are better. So we'll just quickly roll through them so that you can uh, gazump the neurologist when they come down and say, oh, have you considered uh, Dravet's or um, other syndromes? So Paniotopolis, which we all like to talk about because it's uh, a skill just to say it. Um, these are typically children that present around preschool age, four to five, sometimes younger. They often have infrequent seizures, typically from sleep or from nap, so often arise driving in the car or in the early hours of the morning. The seizures are quite classic in that they have very prominent autonomic uh, symptoms, nausea, lots of vomiting while they're, they're fitting. They often have eye deviation because it's arise, the seizures are arising in the occipital lobe, so uh, forced eye version. And they are long. They just go on and on and on. So 30 minutes to two hours plus, and appropriately, these children uh, escalated through status epilepticus management, thought to have an encephalitis that imaged a cyclovir keftriaxone. And then they wake up, and they're perfectly OK. Um, and on an EEG, they have classic uh, spike and wave over the occipital regions. And uh, you, there's a clinical syndrome here, and hopefully it shouldn't be too much of a problem to manage in the uh, PICU, and they should be out of PICU pretty quickly. Um, moving on is a severe myoclonic epilepsy of infancy or Dravet syndrome and these are children who will be bouncing in and out. You'll have a little cluster of children and you will know them well when they come into your intensive care unit because the same child will come in several times for two to three years and everyone knows who they are and the difficulty with these children they present with febrile and afebrile generalised, often uh, lateralised generalized, lateralized chronic seizures uh, going on for, for many, many minutes don't respond to standard anticonvulsants and in fact are precipitated by phenytoin and so they come into the uh, emergency department if they're not recognised to have the syndrome, often the first line anticonvulsant over and above benzos is phenytoin which aggravates their seizure disorder and puts them into status and so if they're known to have that syndrome they should have an individualised management plan which avoids uh, the use of phenytoin, lamotrigine, tegretol and diverts them straight to epilim and levetiracetam for which they will um, hopefully respond to. Um, and again, lennox gastau syndrome, uh, beginning at the age of 3 to 10 years, these children present with frequent episodes of absence, uh, non-convulsive status and tonic status, and again they're exacerbated by benzos, so if you know that a child has this condition, there should again be a warning on their file not to have excessive use of benzodiazepines to try and get them out of their tonic seizures, because it's actually just going to make them harder and more refractory to treat. Um, just quickly, focal cortical dysplasia. Some individuals are known to have an underlying lesion uh, and a relatively well-controlled epilepsy before they arrive in the intensive care unit and are already on medication. For some individuals, a profound period of status epilepticus is the first presentation of a focal cortical dysplasia. Uh, these individuals will often have multiple daily seizures. They're often focal and recognising that the seizure is of the same semiology all the time, starting in the one area, helped by the guidance of EEG, might suggest that they have a cortical dysplasia, and their MRI is clearly from the back of the room abnormal, um, not. <laughs> so um, with the advent of imaging techniques, I mean, this would have been considered a normal study uh, two years ago, three years ago, but with 3T MRI, we can identify a really subtle dysplasia here at the bottom of the sulcus. The grey-white uh, differentiation is blurred there, um, take my word for it. And so this is a child that ended up sort of, was known to have epilepsy, was on treatment, just became became refractory to treatment, started having a seizure five times a day, 20 times a day, 40 times a day, ended up in an intensive care unit and eventually had emergent surgery, um, had that lesion removed and has been seizure free for 10 years now from the day. So it's, it's recognising that some of these individuals that present to the intensive care unit will harbour a little lesion and if you've got the data and look closely, sometimes surgery is the, the best outcome for these children. I think 
The, the condition that we all struggle the most with is these children that present with new onset refractory status. They are the 10 year old that has been perfectly well, has never had a seizure in their entire life and they present with perhaps a couple of seizures the day before or they've been admitted with an isolated seizure there up in the ward and then they rapidly deteriorate. And there's a few acronyms that are given to this uh, condition. Some people might believe that they're different. When you read them, they're exactly the same. Um, it's hard to call febrile infection, um, sorry, devastating epileptic encephalopathy in school-aged children to an adult, so we call it new onset refractory status epilepticus. Uh, I believe that they're all the same condition, but they may have under, different underlying etiologies. And the one that we typically label and see in the pediatric intensive care is a condition called FIRES, which is the febrile infection-related epilepsy syndrome. Um, and again, so the etiology of these conditions is probably not one unique uh, factor, but probably a, a combination or different, different factors in individuals. These children typically present between the age of 3 and 15. There seems to be, for some reason, a male predominance, uh, and the children tend to go through three phases of their epilepsy. So their initial phase, which can be anywhere from one day to uh, almost a couple of weeks, as they have a few febrile seizures. They're not long. They seem reasonably easy to manage. They're given a lot of reassurance that this is a common problem in childhood and won't have any consequence. They have sorry, <coughs> headache and rapidly progress to confusion. Uh, then they go into this acute phase where they just rapidly escalate to very frequent seizures, uh, often a type of a epilepsy partialis continuous uh, with focal uh, status. And this is the point at which they come down to in the intensive care unit and we try and try and try to get them out of their status and nothing seems to work. And then ultimately we extubate them and they have a chronic lifelong uh, terrible epilepsy with uh, cognitive impairment and ongoing epilepsy. Um, the etiology is really unknown in these uh, children. We believe that there's probably an inflammatory process, uh, possibly a gene an underlying genetic predisposing factor. Um, we haven't identified any specific gene which is recognised in other epilepsy syndromes to be associated with these children. Uh, we're frequently aware of more immune-mediated conditions for which we have antibodies and neuronal antibodies, like NMDA, encephalitis, voltage-gated potassium. None of the children presenting with fires have ever had those uh, antibodies identified. So the EEG shows typical uh, findings in a severe epileptic encephalopathy with a slow background and very frequent multifocal seizures or a pled-like activity. Unfortunately, the standard treatment for status epilepticus is uh, universally ineffective. Um, there is some data that inducing a burst suppression coma is associated with a poorer cognitive outcome. And this is some data that's been being talked about a lot. And I guess, Dave, you sort of hinted at this a little bit in terms of your airway management and using a lot of GABA and inhibitory um, agents, and perhaps there is a factor of the anaesthetic itself causing some long-term cognitive impact. However, the difficulty with sort of suggesting that a burst suppression coma is associated with a poor outcome is those that you put into a burst suppression coma uh, by themselves self-selecting themselves into a poorer group. So it's very difficult um, to adjust for the severity of the underlying illness and blame the anaesthetic but there is a little bit of emerging data there which I don't think is robust but I think we should be keeping a, a cautious eye on if there's no benefit of putting them into that deeper uh, sedation in terms of breaking the uh, status then maybe we need to look at our other options. So in small case series, the treatments that have shown to be more beneficial um, in fires is a ketogenic diet, hypothermia, and there's um, some nice papers on single case reports on using ketamine and magnesium, and we'll go through that a little bit further. So would that's kind of a spectrum of, and a flavour of the patients that you see in, in the intensive care unit, and we'll just sort of talk more about the specific treatments and the evidence or not for their efficacy. Um, so as with anything, the, the basics are well established, so, and hopefully this is performed well prior to ICU, but uh, establishing ABC, securing an IV access, and achieving the earliest possible termination of seizure activity to prevent further neuronal damage and seizure recurrence. Um, monitoring to determine for subtle seizures and electrical status, and obviously searching for the underlying cause. And um, there are various algorithms that everyone goes through. It doesn't really guide you much. Um, they're all pretty vague. We start with a benzo, move on to anticonvulsants, uh, anaesthetic agents, and then experimental treatments is kind of the, the mode we go through. 
So this is where it starts to get a little bit disappointing. Um, there is very little evidence-based literature on the best treatment of status. Uh, there are very few randomised and blinded trials. Um, as I've mentioned, this, the definition of status epilepticus is poor, so it's hard to compare um, and even within a single article to pull out the outcome when it's such a mixed bag of patients. Um, often the doses of drugs are variable between studies or, or case reports, or they're not even disclosed. Uh, multiple drugs are used in parallel, so you're fighting very quickly to terminate these seizures. You introduce three or four drugs rapidly in, in sequence, and you don't know if you do get a response which drug it was that uh, resulted in that improvement. So next time, which one do you choose? Um, study populations are not well defined in terms of their etiology, and there's certainly in papers no attempt to stratify for the severity of status. What we do have evidence for is first-line treatment, um, which is fantastic, and hopefully in sometimes it's obviously benzos are used in the, in the intensive care unit when you have an isolated seizure crop up in some of your patients. But what we do know is diazepam is better than placebo, um, lorazepam is better than placebo, lorazepam is better than diazepam and phenytoin for stopping status, and better than diazepam for needing a second drug. IM midazolam, interestingly, is better than IV lorazepam. So benzos are okay. Use a benzo if you start seizing is the bottom line. Um, having said that, this is the, we have robust evidence for this very basic treatment. However, on a recent global audit, um, and I say global, but um, that was a pretty sporadic global audit, I have to say. Australia looked well presented. Russia was there. New Zealand was not there. Um, many, yeah, Canada was not there. The US was there. Um, there were big pockets of the globe that were not there. But anyway, only 38% of cases received first-line treatment in less than an hour. So it's pretty disappointing when we've known this data for some time. Um, and in 32% treatment was delayed for more than six hours. So it's kind of horrifying, really. Um, on a contrary, I did actually email a colleague because I was hopeful to present this while well, presented anyway. Um, so my colleagues in Sydney, John Lawson and Annie Bai, have recently studied um, some of the data from New South Wales, and theirs is a little bit the opposite. They're a bit heavy on their benzos, and that's potentially precipitating ICU um, admissions. And so, you know. It's trying to find the balance of using it appropriately. So um, when a benzo fails, what evidence do we have for anything else? Well, there's a range of studies there. And really class 2B evidence for most other uh, medications. And we'll just quickly flick through them very, very quickly because we've only got a few minutes. Um, so most of us proceed to an IV anti-epileptic uh, medication when a benzo fails. There is very little data over any one drug that is better than the other. Um, Valproate is as, appears to be as effective as phenytoin, um, and given that it has fewer side effects, maybe there's a benefit there. Um, and similarly, Valproate appears to be as effective as uh, phenobarbitone, uh, but again, and again has fewer side effects, so Valproate potentially should be used uh, as early as phenytoin and phenobarbitone. IV levotiracetam, you know, the, these studies are so small in number, um, it seems to be effective in 40 to 50 percent. These are case studies, they're not randomised, they're not blinded. Um, and now lecosamide is entering the market as a drug treatment for refractory status, and there are some good case reports in terminating status in approximately 50 percent of patients that it's given to. So, you know, there isn't a lot of data. What actually happens is we still give phenytoin a lot, um, that's the bottom line. So why, why causes refractory um, status and super refractory status? It, knowing this may alter what, where we think the place of some drugs uh, should be. So we know that in status there is a decrease in uh, functional GABA receptors, and we know that GABA obviously is a primary inhibitory neurotransmitter, so if you have less receptors um, and you keep pushing GABA agents, then the likelihood of that being effective is, is diminishing, and perhaps a the reason why we see a pharmacoresistance developing early and less effect from benzos the longer the seizure persists. Um, alternatively, as the seizures uh, progress, we see an upregulation of NMDA uh, receptors, and NMDA is activated by glutamate, resulting in an influx of calcium and neuronal injury, and resulting in seizure termination to be more difficult. So perhaps relying uh, less on uh, GABA and more on an NDA antagonist may be an option for, for treatment, which uh, 
is where ketamine is an attractive uh, agent. So if seizures continue despite first line and second line agents of a benzo and anticonvulsants, in general most people progress to an anaesthetic agent and uh, call upon, if they haven't already, our friendly ICU uh, colleagues and look towards midazolam, propofol or other barbiturate. And again, the evidence for all of these treatments is extremely poor. Um, each institution often has only a handful of cases and therefore they're limited to case series. There has only been one randomised control study which was aborted due to uh, not enough recruitment of patients. So they had aimed for a power of 150 patients and ended when they could only recruit 24. So just quickly looking, um, I'll just slip through that side, looking at the difference between um, thio, midaz and propofol. Midaz seems, to, uh, this data comes over at least 20 years of looking at published studies and case series and so there is a bit of a bias in terms of um, midazolam perhaps being used in more recent times uh, and being more effective but there's a lot of other modalities in the ICU that may have contributed to that better outcome. So, But midazolam certainly appears to have improvement in seizure control but certainly um, a slightly higher risk of seizure recovery occurrence due to its shorter acting nature, but any of the agents seem to work in two thirds um, roughly. Um, ketamine, again there's only a few case uh, reports, overall the literature suggests that this is results in a poor outcome, but in general ketamine has been used as a last resort agent, so by the time you've self-selected and it's your fifth, sixth, tenth agent, the likelihood of any agent being effective is poor. So, but on a um, individual case reports, when it's used early, it certainly can show uh, effect, and particularly in conditions with fires, there's uh, shown to be quite good effect from early use of ketamine. And um, so ultimately control can be achieved in up to 82%, and its mechanism is certainly an attractive option, and particularly its lack of side effects. Um, in all of the papers talking about management of status and refractory status epileptic come the inhalation agents. Um, it seems, uh, I don't know why they keep talking about them because they don't seem very practically easy to use in an intensive care setting and universally seem uh, fairly poor in terms of outcomes so I'm just going to skip over those because I don't think they really have a role. Um, magnesium infusion is certainly gained popularity after its recognition of improving status in preeclamptic patients. Again, the mechanism of action is uncertain but thought to block an NDA, so potentially um, is a nice mechanism in, in refractory status. Uh, unfortunately, there's very rare case reports, uh, and so the efficacy is not clear, but it's safe and it's an, not an unreasonable option to consider. Again, hypothermia, theoretically attractive, case reports and looking at status are few and far between. Uh, nine cases and four reports uh, showed some degree of efficacy. Immunotherapy I'll just touch on because we all seem to do it. Um, the data around it, if you don't actually have evidence of an immune mediated condition, uh, the data for immunotherapy affecting status is uh, almost non-existent. So if you have a recognized uh, immune mediated encephalopathy, then there's evidence that that will be effective. If you don't, um, I guess the harm is marginal and um, I guess the difficulty is you don't often know if you have an immune mediate, so you're, you're treating on spec in, in the possibility that you have an immune medi mediated condition, but unless that is proven positive, the likelihood of ongoing uh, effect from immune agents is minimal and so was on, because drinks are around the corner, aren't they? Um, <laughs> give a burst while you're waiting for treatment to, uh, results to come through, but uh, there's no place for ongoing uh, continued immunotherapy. Ketogenic diet, uh, very effective anti-epileptic agent, may have anti-inflammatory properties and certainly uh, can show efficacy. Surgery in well-selected cases of lesional epilepsy. Um, treatment algorithms, the lack of data, it's very hard to guide you, but benzodiazepine, anticonvulsant, methodical use through uh, anaesthetic agents and then experimental agents. Um, overall outcome, 36% do well, 40% do poorly, and a quarter die. Um, so effect, with regards to factors, those that have pre-existing epilepsy are more likely to do well, uh, otherwise there is no significant difference. 
So my recommendation is that we all need to be contributing to multi-centre studies. Uh, we need really good documentation of seizures, etiology, drugs, time they're given, time uh, dose, uh, therapy, therapeutic levels that were attained, so we can actually identify which medications are providing more benefit. Everything needs to be done methodical with very clear documentation of response clinically and on EEG in conjunction with neurology and intensivists. Thank you. Thank you.